Welcome to the Business Brains and the Bottom Line podcast. My name is Paul Delegro, your host, and my guest today is Renee Cohen, the president of Flow Consulting. Uh, welcome to the show, Renee. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. So happy to have you. So if I remember correctly, you're out in L.A., right? Yes. Yes. Sunny L.A., although it's not really sunny right now, but Yeah. So what part of L.A.? Um, in Los Angeles, so oh, in the in technically the city called the, the yeah, it's technically called San Fernando Valley, but it's in LA. LA is pretty big. Well, cool. Well, so you know, we have several topics we could discuss. That you know, you work for a uh, you actually the president of a of a consulting business consulting company, and really kind of the topic we thought we'd talk about today is kind of leadership and how you know how you view leadership, how you how you train your clients to address those issues around leadership. And so tell me a little bit about flow consulting to start with, and then we'll kind of dive right into the the leadership uh, aspect of this. Yeah. So uh, flow consulting is a business operational consulting company. And what we do is we're brought on by companies um, big or small, and it's usually project based. So maybe they have something like a quarterly goal in mind, or they want to look at how to better perform, um, hold people accountable, uh, put processes in place, and then we come in and we do that. And so I, I think we talked about leadership being a great topic because when you do consulting and you get to be with a lot of different businesses and leaders, you really get to see such different leadership styles and you, you get to experience the things that their staff sees of them. And, and so it's, it's a really fun exciting um, uh, experience to be having with these companies. Yeah. You know, leadership is a funny, a funny thing sometimes because it comes in all shapes and sizes, right? Some people lead by example. Some people lead by the, you know, things they say and there's good leaders and bad leaders. So what do you, what do you think of the, the top qualities of a good leader? So I think a good leader does lead by example. I think a good leader is compassionate, but yet firm, is very clear and can communicate what they're looking for. Um, but I do think a leader needs to most definitely lead by example. I think that if you're going to hold other people accountable, you need to hold yourself accountable too. Yeah. You know, you know, you, you reminded me of something. I, I, I just started thinking back of all the people I've worked with and for over my lifetime. Uh, so my career is spanning, you know, something like 40 years now. <clears throat> um, and I kind of, if I put people in buckets, like the ones I'd run through a wall for and the ones that I wouldn't, I guess the one common commonality is how those good leaders make me feel about myself. Yeah. Is I it, think would we you talked say that's about common? It. Absolutely. I think even doing the consulting thing, when I see a client call me, and I think the same thing goes for your staff, right? When I see a client call me and I'm like, oh, gosh, right? Like, they're, oh, God, like, I really don't feel like dealing with this person right now, right? Like, that's a great sign on as to whether or not they're a good leader. If your staff right. sees an email from you or a call from you and they are dreading it, then you're not being a good leader. If they see that and they're in the middle of something and they're excited to answer, they want to pick up your call. They respect you enough sure. to do that. Then you're, you, that's a great sign that you're a good leader. No question. I think we've all been there. I mean, I, what you just said really resonated with me because I, I can tell you when I pick up the phone and in years past see some people, I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to send that to voicemail. Can't deal with him right now. But you're right. But you're right. It's it's the way people make you feel and, and they lift you up, right? They've got your back. They lift you up. Now, you're going to have to have difficult conversations at times, right? Not like okay. everything's perfect and they're going to support you 100%. If they need to have a difficult conversation, they do it, but they do it in a way that's constructive. Absolutely. Right? I was going to say it depends on how you have that conversation, right? I think if you have it in a way that's constructive and you're willing to see the other person's point of view and you know, un try to understand their perspective on the situation, right? But still be firm in what you expect of them, your expectations, all of that stuff, then 
I think the conversation can go well and you can still leave that even if you are holding them accountable to something, you could still leave that conversation maintaining the respect that they have for you and being a good leader. I don't think it has to be one or the other. Yeah, no, great point. And, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with people, I mean, and this is kind of sports related too, do you treat all your employees the same? Do you try to be that, quote, fair to everyone? Or do you have different ways of working with different people? I think you have to meet people where they are, right? Like, if I know that Joe likes um, firm boundaries and does well with tough love, then that's how you speak to them. If you know that someone else gets a little bit sensitive, then you wouldn't necessarily say the same thing to that person that you would to Joe or whomever it is, right? So you have to meet people where they are and understand their language because yeah. at the end of the day you have a you have a goal in your business you want that you want to achieve that goal so you have to finesse the situation that's going to get to get you to where you want to be yeah no that's a great point i i you know and i knew you were going to say that by the way even though we didn't talk about this cuz I, I i agree with you 100% uh, but this is your podcast not mine so i wanted to hear you say it right yeah. But, it's like uh, your kids, right? You you yeah. have kids. When your kids are yeah. growing up, you're not you're gonna treat them differently when they're doing different when they're both doing the same thing because you know right. it works for each one yeah. of them. Yeah, different personalities. Some 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 people just handle that criticism and constructive criticism different and others you have to kind of pat on the back and so, you know, console a little bit more. But no, I think you definitely uh you're definitely on the right like track. Like that whole there. love language thing. It's yeah, like that whole love language thing, right? Yeah. Like everybody's got a love. It's like the same thing, but it's just yeah. how how does that translate in business? Now, as a leader, um, does a leader have to like? Let me. So you're gonna probably know my answer to this, right? But let me. Does a leader ha leading people have to have done that role of the people that he's leading? In Definitely other words, I'll, I'll give an example from me. I've always been in sales and having a sales manager that's never sold to me always didn't make sense. Now, not that the, there's some that weren't very, that weren't good, but it just, they don't have the experience that you have doing it all these years. That makes sense? Yeah. I think if you're looking to fill a role, you want that person to have had experience in it, right? But let's say you start a company. I don't give you an example. Like you start a consumer packaged goods company, right? Maybe you don't know manufacturing. You're going to bring in someone that does it, but that doesn't mean that you can't be a leader to them because you don't know how to do that role. You fill in the positions that you need, but some of the most successful people have never lead hundreds, thousands of people, but they've never done the role that they're leading the, for, you know, for their staff. And I think that that's okay. You just, people stop themselves from starting their business or, or taking the next leap because they feel like they might have imposter syndrome or there's this thought that, oh, I've never done it. So who am I to say anything? Right. No, and I think, you know, after you've been doing any any industry for a long time, we all have a little bit of imposter syndrome, I think. Yeah. I don't I know mean, anyone. I that the, yeah, we all do. I mean, as much as experience as we have, do you still wake up and say, you know, you look at other people that are at the top of the industry and you go, wow, I'm not there. And, you know, you feel like you're faking it half the time, you know, mm -hmm. but then when you step back and you go, no, I do have the experience. I've been doing this a long time. I know what I'm doing. Uh, so yeah. is that, is that mix? But there's something to be said about that cliche of like fake it till you make it. There are going to be things that you're not going to know how to do. And as a leader, you might need to fake it, but eventually... Yeah. Yeah. You're going to gain the knowledge and you can utilize your staff to also help you to gain that knowledge. And that's okay. That doesn't mean that you're a bad leader. Right. Yeah. And that the fake it till you make it thing. I, I agree with that. It's like putting yourself, overextending yourself a little bit because how do you get experience unless you have the experience? So you've, it's like the, the chicken and the egg, right? Yeah. Yeah. And some people learn better through experience than they do through learning. Like, you could have told me growing up not to do X, Y, and Z, and I would have done those things. Like, I was a wild child. I would have done it all. You know, there was no controlling me. But for me, I learned from experiences. So I had to have, like, touched that live wire to know that, crap, I shouldn't have touched that live wire, right? Yep. But 
So you you do need to just do it all. Yeah. No, I, I hear you. So what's your, so when you meet with a customer, you meet with a client, um, what type of program do you have, right? When you, you know, I know there's diff, probably different things they want you to come in for, but what's your program? I know you have the four pillars you talked about I, I was reading on your website. Tell me a little bit about that and how you go about yeah, so there's, like, the, go ahead. So there's different things that I do. Usually when I meet with someone, I just listen. I think a lot of times when we talk a lot, we're not really hearing what someone really needs. And they might say they need something, but then there's like the tone under the under message of what they really need. So I'll meet with someone and let them tell me, vent to me, you know, about whatever it is, vent to me about their company not getting to where it needs to be. Everything's a mess. Their staff isn't doing their job, whatever the problem is. And then from there, I tailor more of a uh, a plan around what needs to be done. So it's like kind of tailored around them. Sometimes it's more so just a coaching thing to leadership, or sometimes it's more of a hands-on approach where I actually dive into certain departments and look at what their, like, their staff is doing, try to find ways to, you know, cut down time and expenses and all of that. But I do think that there are these four pillars that make a company successful. And um, one is is clarity. So clarity around your vision and what it is that you're filling the need of. Everybody goes through their day, no matter what the com- when, no matter what the business is. Everybody goes through their day trying to solve a problem. You have to be very clear on what is the problem that you're solving. And what are you moving towards? What's the solution? So the clarity around that and then how you convey that to people. What is your, you know, avatar of a, of a client look like or customer, right? So the first piece is clarity. The second piece is, um, precision. So understanding what has to be done, what tasks have to be done and really doing the things that count and getting clear on what that each job role looks like. What are the tasks and making and streamlining that process? The third piece is accountability. Accountability is around, one, holding yourself accountable, holding your staff accountable, but you take the things from one and two, which is the clarity and the precision, and you relay right. that to the team, right? Like those are, that's why those two are first. And then you have the accountability piece. And then the fourth, <clears throat> and sometimes I think one of the most important things is communication. You don't know how to communicate all of those things to everybody then the rest doesn't matter. Most times where leadership fails is communication. And it's communication around what they expect of people, um, what they need them to do, what that looks like, what the outcome has to be, all of those things. And like we talked about earlier, is everybody has a different communication style and they have a different way of hearing things. I might tell you to do something and you hear it differently than if I were to tell someone else to do something. Right. So I think having that person relay that information back to him, just make sure like, are we on the same page about this before they move forward with doing something? You know, I think that's a difficult uh, skill to have, to be honest with you, because the way I communicate is different than the way you communicate. And we may say the same things to people and they may get offended by the way I say it. And you say it just in a little different way and it gets communicated differently. Uh, And I think the classic is, well, I don't know why they were upset or I don't know why they didn't understand. I explained it to them. But again, it's a delivery sometimes, right? Yeah. And I think if you look at a pattern, if th- there's always patterns in your personal life and in your business, right? If you're constantly having issues with staff and or vendors, partnerships, and it's just like a merry-go-round of people coming in and coming out or giving something to be done and it not being completed, then likely you need to look in the mirror because- yeah. If that's the pattern, then the the problem is not them. The problem is you, and it likely comes down to your communi- your communication style and or the fact that maybe you have too many expectations of people. Sometimes I notice that like people think because they you pay them that they owe you their life. Like no, this is your business or you're the manager, right? They're not going to treat it the same way as you. They're not going to be taking your calls at nine o'clock at night. That's just unrealistic. Yeah, that's funny. That's a great point, by the way. Um, you know, we all we all have our you know impressions of how things should be run, right? 
and sometimes they're different than management. And that's actually the one thing I look for when I have customers. When I see a lot of tenure on the people I'm I'm working with, that's a good sign to me. Mm-hmm. But when I see people six months, a year, year and a half as the longest tenured people, that's the huge red flag. Yeah, yeah, because they they're not staying there long enough, which means they're probably not doing a good job. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we just expect too much of people. Honestly, I think I've seen so many business owners expect things that are unrealistic and they think that everybody should be sweating it out like they are to get their business going or to the place that they want it to be. But no, that's on you. Like you hire someone for a job, for a job description. You have to be clear on what that is and don't expect them to go outside of that. They're not going to. Unless yeah. you plan to pay an exponential amount of money. Yeah. Well, you know, and that we, we, I've talked about this on other shows, that whole work-life balance thing. I know it's somewhat of a cliche, but it's true. I mean, I remember earlier in my career, I could not unwind at all. Like on the mm-hmm. weekends, all I thought about was work. And it, and it was, the stress was killing me. And I, now I'm at a different point in my career. I'm, I'm you know, approaching the end of it and I don't have the stresses like I used to have. So I'm much more relaxed about it. But I, I, I always was would think how do you disengage from work like uh, easier said than done like don't think yeah. of an elephant well you're going to think of an elephant if i say that like how do you how do you disengage from work's a big one i think it's tough i think you have to be conscious of it like in the beginning when i would work with clients i'd take them all in right and then now when i see people that aren't good leaders or they're not taking the advice or their expectations of me are unrealistic i'm like i don't care how much you pay me I am not doing this. This is just not worth it because you have to have a balance. Um, You also have to be clear. Like if you know that your work hours are from nine to five or whatever it is, and you see a message come in before then, you cannot respond to it. And you have to make the conscious effort not to even look at it. Or if you want to look at it, fine, look at the email, but don't respond because then you're just creating a negative pattern. But work-life balance is super hard. Yeah, that's a great point, by the way. I, I'm guilty of texting people and emailing people outside hours. My expectation is they're not going to respond. Like if I text someone or send them an email at night, I don't expect them to respond to me. I expect a response in the morning. Yeah, yeah. And I, I had that. I had that with a client where they would message at night and, you know, maybe sometimes they would have liked a response, but they didn't expect one. But I'm also like them that I also respond and message at night. So now you have two people doing the same thing and then we're just creating a bad pattern together and it's feeding one another. So yeah, it's you gotta tough. be disciplined, right? Yeah. Yeah. So And people well, don't like it when you set a boundary. They get upset. Yeah. Well, because they expect you to be there when they want you to be there. Uh, I think the worst industry for that I've heard is like real estate. Uh, I have some real estate broker friends of mine that, They said, Paul, you can't believe when people call me. Like I could be on vacation knowing I'm on vacation and they're calling me at like 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, I think because you have a lot of money on the line and especially if they're, I don't know if they're in residential, right? It's like people, people have a personal attachment. I think when there's like a personal attachment to something, it makes it even harder. It's their home, you know, they have anxiety around it. Exactly. Well, so I want to change direction a little bit here, Renee. How did you get into this? I'm always curious when someone starts their own business, you're an entrepreneur, obviously, you have your own business, been doing this for a long time. You know, what was your career path like and what possessed you to open, you know, open your own firm? Yeah, so I I have an interesting story. I started a software company when I was 20 years old. Wow. And it it basically was remote what's called remote desktop services, so if if let's say you call support and they can remotely log into your computer, that is using that technology. So at the time, Microsoft was the only one doing it for the Windows platform, and we were the first to do it for the Mac platform. And we got a patent and have patents for that technology. We had that company. I would go into like Fortune 500 companies. I was young. I didn't have any fear. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this, right? Love it. So different than when you start something when you're when you're older and you have kids. Like I have kids now. It's a little bit different, right? I wouldn't take such a big risk. But I did that for a long time. What ended up happening with that business is 
we got swallowed up by larger players in the industry, um, some of which are public is public knowledge, some of the cases and some, you know, we settled outside of court for uh, patent infringement. One case that we recently won in front of a jury was against TeamViewer. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but I am actually. Uh, they're a large company. Yeah. So we couldn't really compete anymore. A lot of these people started coming into into the space and started infringing on the patents. And then we had to end up going into litigation. So that was that part of my life. I've been working since I was 14 years old. It's just something that was ingrained in me as a child. That's and good. then later in life, I had kids. I became more of a stay-at-home mom. And I gave my CEO position to someone else that was working underneath me. And I just stayed on the board of that company. Fast forward to like four or five years ago, right? I ended up getting divorced. And I had been working to a limited capacity while I was marrying. But now you've got to take care of yourself. And it can be really tough for women, especially if you get out of the workforce and then you want to get back in. It's, it's, it's a tough one. And yeah. well, I, I've often said, how do you exp like people know that you had babies and you were a mother? And I think that's when my kids were young, my wife didn't work either. I that's the way I wanted it. That's we wanted it that way. And so, but you're right, that five year gap doesn't help, right? No, you've been out of the work for us for five years, and then add that on top of the imposter syndrome, and it's like you're you're scared. I know other women that are going through a divorce or have gotten divorced. And they don't know what to do. They're like, I haven't worked in five, 10 years. What do I do with yeah. myself? And yeah. especially when you're going through divorce, it gets messy and you know you can end up with nothing and you really have to start over. So for me, I don't, didn't ever want to have to be in that position. I didn't want to need anything. I wanted to be able to take care of myself because that was just ingrained in me. You, start, you work, you take care of yourself. You never rely on anyone. You make it happen for yourself. So then- um, I got referred to a company that was looking for someone um, to help with their operations. They wanted to move away from doing things manually and move digitally. And so I was hired by them to implement software and create processes around what they were doing. And from there, it just kind of got referrals one after another after another. And that's kind of how it happened. Like it just just came about and was the direction that I was taken in. Yeah, nice. Because I, I was looking at some, you know, looking at your website and some of the things you do about, you know, improving efficiency and performance. That's a little bit different than the, the leadership coaching. So you do do different things, not just the, the you know, the leadership coaching, correct? Yeah. So I do more hands-on operational, I get into the business and really make changes within, which changes can be so difficult. The thing, like I always say with that is, People expect, we live in like an Amazon world where people think <laughs> you're going to get two-day delivery, you're going to get a prime on your results. Like, that doesn't work that way. It takes time. Um, so that's more of like a longer commitment where I'm really deep in there. But then I also have um, where I do coaching, where maybe someone doesn't necessarily want me or doesn't want to pay or doesn't need me and they have someone to do some of those things. And they don't need me like hands hands on knee deep, so I'll do coaching. So, an example is like I have uh, an online gaming company that I work with that I just coach their staff and give them advice on on things that they can do to improve efficiency. Where then they'll take it and run with it. Nice. Which do you which do you like better? The the I personally leadership like co the coaching better. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can see why. I think it goes back to the leadership piece, which is sometimes you're you're hired by a leader that is not the best leader, and they treat you the same way they treat their other staff, and then you end up feeling like, what the hell am I doing this for? And that's why I think leadership is so important. And once that happens and I start to get this feeling inside, that feeling when you get the call and the text message and all that, I'm like, this isn't for me. It's time yeah. It's time to exit this one. Yeah. So based on that comment, I'm assuming you've had to fire a few customers over the years, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's Which hard to tough. do, though. 
that's it's so tough. Have you? I'm sure you've done it in your career. Hundred percent. You know, customers that just are unbearable to work with. At some point, you just wake up one day and go, "This isn't even worth it anymore." Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter hold, how much money like, you pay me. Right, and and I've said this: when you have a customer that's that's tough to work with and unbearable, um, I look at it like a bad marriage. Uh -huh. I say. You try to make it work. You go to counseling and whatever, you, you know, you try to work things out. But at some point, there, and there is a point we just say, I can't do this anymore. It's, let's just go our separate ways. And I think it's best for both of us. Yeah. And I've had, I've had people say, like, why don't you tell them what they're doing wrong or what's wrong, right? And I've learned that you can give advice to people, but it's just, do they want it? Do they really want to receive it? Are they hearing it? I can tell people to do things all day long, just like someone could tell me to do something, right? It's easier to, to give advice to others than it is to take it, but I can give them advice, but it doesn't do anything. So sometimes, like, I had a client recently that was, like, basically shitting on me, let's say, right? One minute, I'm the best thing that's ever happened, and the next minute, they're stressed out, and they're not seeing things the way that they want because they live in a prime world in their mind and they think they're going to get results in, in two seconds and they don't mind piling on the work over and over and expect you to be the unicorn that comes and saves their day. But um, so I learned to just say, OK, thank you. Thank you for the feedback, because me arguing, it's going to do nothing. Yeah, really. And this isn't working and I appreciate it. And that's it. Uh, why do I need the last word? OK, let them yeah. have it. Takes restraint. I love it. It's tough, you know? Yeah. So again, kind of changing directions here. Are you using, AI is so such a popular buzzword today, right? We're, we're all talking about, especially I'm in technology sales. It's, it's a big buzzword for us. Are you using AI in your s solution selling? And, and how, if so, how? So if the, if the company has existing uh, technology in place, like, AI became such a huge buzzword, right? But it's like, it's existed. Machine learning has existed for a long time now. If they have a platform that they use, uh, I'll look and see whether or not there are a lot of companies are integrating AI functionality into software. So I try to find ways. I don't believe in having 10 different tools to get the job done. I think sometimes it ends up creating confusion and there's more to maintain. So if it if something exists within the the platforms they're using, then I I try to utilize them. So it just all depends on what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, I know uh, a lot of companies now. Uh, there's there's, uh, there's several different AI platforms out there now, and they, and, they, and there's more and more coming out on a regular basis. So it's it's kind of tough to navigate that to see what really works and 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 really more importantly how to use it that's what i think most people struggle with is how can we yeah you get all this ai information but how can we use it to better our company yeah i mean usually like let's say someone hires me to come in and look at things what i do is i speak to the the senior leadership and then i find out like what do they think the roles are in their company and the job descriptions and what are the different departments and then i actually go into those and then i talk to them uh, the staff about what is it that they're doing? What does their day to day look like? And I have a series of questions that I go through and I, I take note of that. And then I participate in doing that because someone might think that the best way to do something is step one, three and five. Right. Like, but maybe there's a better way of doing it. Maybe they can do it in a different order that's going to cut down on time. But because you're so used to doing something in a certain way, it's hard to look at it in a different perspective. It's not like I am some genius, right? But I come in with a fresh pair of eyes. So I actually then will repetitively do the task myself and then look at it really? from a different perspective. Yeah, that's that more hands-on approach. Yeah. So it sounds like you you do have kind of a uh, uh, programmatic approach to this, right? You've been doing this long enough. You ha You do know what works. But I'm sure you deviate, but uh, sounds like you got a pretty good system in place. Yeah, I think our life experiences end up shaping us to what we should be doing in life or the way that we think or whatever. I think my my upbringing and being taught sure. that I need to learn how to do things and having gone through, you know, ups and downs and challenges in, in my childhood and all that have 
built me in a way that looks at things process oriented. Like when I yeah. do a task, I think about this is where I am. This is the end result. What is going to be the quickest way to do this? And what order should I do it in that's going to help to get the best results? So just tra just translate it into what I do. So who would be the ideal client for you? Like what when you walk into a company and you see A, B, C, and D, you say, they need me or no, nah, they're in actually pretty good shape. They don't need me. What are the things you look for? So if they're a startup, let's say I, I work with, I've worked with startups all the way up to like 300 employees. So if they're a startup, their needs are usually a little bit different. They need help figuring out what are the positions I need to fill? How can I, you know, achieve my goal? Maybe they don't know necessarily how this department should be built or how to complete certain tasks within there. Because as a leader, you haven't always done everything in every different department. Right. I have had the luxury of working with different companies, so I understand how to do a lot of different things. I could, I've worked with, you know, B2B SaaS company, and I've also worked with, uh, you know, as I mentioned, online gaming, real estate, construction, consumer packaged goods, right? So it's a, it's a wide variety, um, which gives me the luxury to be able to help them to figure out how to do things, which platforms are the best, what should I do? Sure. If I want to advertise those types of things. So that's a smaller company. Then you've got like midsize, which technically midsize would be considered up to two or 300 employees anyways. But let's just yeah. call it like the 50 range. For them, it's more so about making things optimized. Like you already have the departments built out. You already have the jobs filled, right? Now, how do we get better at doing that and 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 minimize error? And then when you get to the bigger size, right, the two to 300 employees, they usually have someone in the company that does thing, does operations. So they don't necessarily need me for that. They already have their processes built out. They have all of that. Usually what ends up happening at that level is leadership needs, is having a difficult time maybe holding people accountable. Maybe they need KPIs in place. Maybe they need to structure what their meetings are going to look like so they can get the most out of it. Uh, so you're dealing with something more of that variety versus getting knee deep and looking at all the process. Maybe it's also telling them whether or not their data is clean and they're getting accurate results. Very good. Well, if someone um, listening or watching to this wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do that, Renee? So they could go to flowconsulting.ai, or they can also check me out on social media at It's Renee Cohen, and they can message me there. They can fill out a form online, either either way. I also try to, on my social media, I try to post tips and things like that, different platforms that I've tried that I like, things that I'm seeing, you know, are working well for other companies or aren't working so well, so... Even if they don't necessarily want time with me, they can go there and see it. And usually if I find that a company is interested, I'm all for adding value first. So what sure. I'll do is a self and reach out. I don't necessarily, I don't charge them for a consultation. Like we can have a quick call. I will give you my two cents and I will tell you what I think you need to do. And if we don't end up working together, that's okay with me, but at least they got some value. I, I just yeah. think adding value in the world is so important. I think that's a great strategy. Too many people feel like they get nickel and dime like lawyers, you know, every 15 yeah. minutes. But, uh, you know, if you invest the time, that's kind of the way our company works. We invest a little bit of time on the front end with our customers to show add value. And then they say, okay, these, this looks like a group I could work with. And we go from there. So, yeah. And if not now, they'll think of you in the future or they'll that's refer right. someone. That's right. So, well, I think on that note, Renee, uh, we'll end it there. I think people know how to get in touch with you. I've really enjoyed this conversation. We covered a lot of different subjects. It sounds like you're doing great. You've got a great resume and a great, uh, a great business, and I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Well, Renee, thanks for being on the show. And that's a wrap for this edition of the Business Brains and the Bottom Line podcast. 